Welcome to Digital Marketing Power Hour, where we will have presentations from three speakers. Each speaker will uh, present for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will have a shared Q&A. So please put your questions into the activity feed. Uh, this is where we get in a little bit of the digital marketing weeds. Um, but I think there's something to learn no matter what level you are, are at with digital marketing. So first up, I'm really excited to introduce a uh, Capacity Interactive colleague, Jess Isgro, who is a consultant at Capacity Interactive, where she works with a variety of arts and cultural organizations on digital marketing strategy and implementation. Jess will be talking about organic social content, particularly sharing how to analyze organic content with some free tools. Welcome. Jess, where are you? Hi there. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, as Eric said, my name is Jess Isgro. Uh, I, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm a white woman with shoulder length brown hair wearing a leopard print blouse. And I'm coming to you today from New Jersey, which is the traditional territory of the Muncie Lenape people. And I ask you to join me in taking a moment to acknowledge their community past, present, and future generations. Uh, as Eric said, today I'm here to talk to you about organic social content, which is one of my absolute favorite topics. Uh, so let's jump right in with a quick definition. Get to my next slide. There we go. All righty. So what is organic social content? When we say organic, we mean anything that is created, posted, and available to users for free on social channels. So this is not paid content. We're not talking about ads, sponsored posts, boosted posts, anything you want to call a paid post. We're just talking about the free content. And you can create this content on, on a variety of platforms. For the purpose of today's conversation, we're just going to focus on Facebook and Instagram. So on these channels, organic content is what lives on your Facebook and Instagram profiles and feeds including photos, videos, links, live videos, and stories. So here are just a few examples of organic content from some of Capacity Interactive social channels. On the left, you have a, an organic Facebook video. In the middle, you have an organic Instagram image, and on the right, an organic Instagram story. The quickest way to recognize that these are indeed organic posts is because you don't see the word sponsored at the top underneath the brand name and the logo. So why should you invest in organic content creation? There are a whole lot of reasons. We're gonna focus on three of the main reasons. First and foremost, time spent online has only increased this year. If you're anything like me, your screen time report looks vastly different now than it did in 2019. And we've seen that in the data too. From January to March, uh, the New York Times reported that Facebook usage was up 27% in terms of time spent. And similar data has kept coming over the course of the following months. Of course, it's changed. We don't necessarily see that same huge bump that we saw right at the beginning of the year. But most recently, a study from eMarketer noted that on average, users are spending seven more minutes on social media. And at first glance, seven minutes might not seem huge. But when you think about how brief an interaction can be on social media and still be meaningful, seven minutes is a whole lot of opportunity. That's 14 30 second video views. That's countless post reactions, shares, and a whole lot of scrolling. So this translates to increased opportunities to engage with an audience that's really craving that interaction on social. We have to meet our audiences where they are and become a part of their routine. If we see it evolving, we need to evolve right along with it. Our second reason is that alongside the increase in time spent online, we've also seen an increase in organic reach, which is just defined as the number of users reached on social media without paid promotion. This chart shows average organic reach per social post each month from February through August of 2020. And this is data gathered across a variety of CI clients. What we can see here is that in February, we we're at our lowest average reach per post at about 6,500. In the months that followed, as the social landscape really started to change, organic reach changed along with it. We were up 90% February to March, 80% February to April, and May through August saw dips from those two first peak months, but still even at the lowest, which was in June, we were about 15% up from what we'd seen in February. So what this shows us is that not only are users spending more time online, but our industry has been successful in attaining improved reach because of it. 
And our third reason is that organic content is free and it works really well with paid strategy as well. It's a great trial ground to find out what you what content users are going to respond to best. You can learn from that and leverage it for when it's time for paid promotion. This is more important now than ever. We're all trying to make every single dollar count. So if you're going to take the time and the media money to invest in paid content, you wanna make sure it's content that really is going to succeed. So let's take a look at an example of an organization that did just that. This is an example from the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and it's a great instance where they created a connection between their organic content and their paid content when they recognized success from something that was initially posted organically. In this clip, which I'll play just a few seconds of, you'll hear and see two Chicago Symphony Orchestra musicians, one on piano and one on cello, playing an arrangement of Hallelujah. Let's watch a few seconds and then chat. So when posted organically, this post attained really incredible tra traction and viral status pretty much right away. It drove about 14,000 one minute video views within the first 24 hours and was shared really widely. So given that performance, the CSO made the decision to slate this into a paid branding campaign. Once promoted, engagement increased exponentially. The video started to gain roughly 40 to 50,000 additional one minute views per day over the course of the next week. And after that, views kept coming in. Actually, to date, we still see views begin to tick up and up each week for this post. Results like this are possible when you pay a careful eye towards organic performance and towards the how users are reacting to the content that's being promoted on your pages each day. So let's talk about where to start analysis. Not surprisingly, I recommend that you start with the data. Sure, there's definitely room for personal preference, organizational priorities, creative style. They're all gonna play a role in the types of content that you choose to create, but the data should be what leads you to an understanding of what is and is not working. The platforms actually provide all the data you could possibly want and then some. This is through Facebook and Instagram Insights, which are both offered in platform. They give you a wealth of information on the page level so you can understand your fans and followers, as well as on the post level. You can learn about individual post reach, distribution, the audiences reached, the types of engagement, video view data, you name it. At CI, the way that we start to parse through all of that is we combine the power of Facebook and Instagram insights with Google Data Studio, which is a tool that allows you to build really highly customizable, very flexible reports. So I'll walk you through an example of what one of those might look like. This is just one of many ways to organize the uh, extent of the data that's available. Up at the top, uh, there are some overall Facebook metrics. So engagement rate, new page likes, video views, number of posts, number of impressions, Beneath that, you can see organic reach to date charted out over time with some year over year change. That dark line is this year, light line is last year. Underneath that, some general Instagram metrics, total followers, total media count, reach last month, engagement last month. And then beneath that is where we start to get into the nitty gritty details. We can look on the individual post level. What had the highest to lowest engagement rate? Where did we see the majority of video views? You can even drill down on post types. Maybe you just wanna analyze your photos. Now this isn't the analysis, right? It's just the data collection. And there's certainly a lot of different ways to collect the data. This is just one example of that, but it kind of gets at the heart of showing you just how very much is available. And it's useful to know information like how many followers you have, how many video views you've driven, but the real analysis begins to help you answer questions like, why did that happen? How did that happen? And how can we drive similar results moving forward? And there are a whole different variety of places that you can jump in to start that analysis. I'm going to offer four of the main ones that I find to be really helpful, especially for an initial organic social content analysis. The first one is engagement rate. This is one of the most useful and prevalent metrics out there. Uh, it's defined as the total number of engagements. So think clicks, reactions, shares, pretty much anything you can do on a post divided by the total reach. So I like to think of this as the total number of times that your content is interacted with divided by the opportunities that users had to do so. It paints a picture of active content consumption and is really helpful to highlight what users are and are not responding to. 
It's also available across both pages. So you can look at total engagement rate for Facebook, total for Instagram, as well as each type of post you could publish. So it makes it really easy to compare and contrast your photo performance with your video performance, with your album performance, et cetera. A second opportunity and area for analysis is one of really the biggest FAQs for social content creators, which is time of day. How many times have you asked or been asked or found yourself Googling, what's the best time of day to post on social? And there are a lot of resources that try to answer this question. There's certainly merit in each of them, but there's nothing that's more powerful than your own data. When is your audience best responding to your social posts? Is it early in the day, late in the day? You can use your own data to begin to answer that question. And there are also deeper questions that relate to post timing and frequency that you can begin to ask as well, such as how many posts per day are having the strongest results? Do we notice weaker engagement when we post more or less? How much time should you allow between posts? What happens when you're posting two hours apart versus 10 hours apart? And what happens when you're posting across platforms? Do you see a change in engagement if you're on Facebook and Instagram at the same time? Do you see a change in engagement if you wait a few hours in between or if you post different content? You can also begin to visualize data to help answer some of these questions as well. Here's an example where the dark blue line is showing the number of posts on a given day. The light blue line is showing engagement rate. And that black line in the middle is showing us that from digging into some of the data here, we see that the most consistent engagement is coming between two and three posts per day. Now, this is not the answer all the time for everyone. I'm not going out and saying, you know, everybody needs to create two to three posts per day. But in this instance, this is what this type of data would tell us. From there, you can begin to drill down into those specific dates. You can ask more questions about which posts did best on those days. Was the engagement coming primarily from one post or another? And from there, you can begin to build a fuller picture of your audience's behavior. The third area to explore are types of reach. Talked a bit about organic versus paid already. Organic reach can then be broken down into non-viral and viral reach. Non-viral reach measures reach from fans and followers of your page through visiting content on your page, whereas viral reach is a result of someone sharing your content and that ending up in a new user's feed. Neither is correct. We're not aiming for one over the other, and both certainly have their place in your social landscape. But understanding how that breaks down for an individual post can tell you something about who it's appealing to and perhaps why. So let's look at one of the examples here. Up at the top, uh, this is showing data for two different posts. We'll take a look at the first one. In the left-hand column, you have the total number of reach. So we have about 25,000. The number of shares on that post was 72. So if you're only looking at those first two columns of data, you might say, I don't really know if this was shared a whole lot for 25,000 reach, only 72 people shared. But where you really start to contextualize this is in the percentage reach breakdown for non-viral versus viral. 33% of the users reached, 33% of that 25,000, were people who were already aware of you, fans of you, following you, whereas almost 69% of that was new users. That goes to show you that this had you know, real potential to impact newer audiences, acquisition audiences. And then the column on the rightmost side shows you likes on post shares. It shows you how often those people who were reached through viral reach were actually engaging with that post. And it totals about 850. So that shows more of the impact than just looking at reach and shares on their own. Again, neither type is correct. Both have their benefits. Non-viral reach might be able to show us what has the best traction with our nearest and dearest. Viral reach might show us what has the potential for the broadest appeal, and there are certainly moments to create content for each. And lastly, you can evaluate each of these previous areas within the context of post composition. You can consider elements such as character count, tone, post copy length, asset type, video length, and from there, you can start to uncover patterns. Maybe you find that your shortest posts have the highest viral reach. Maybe you find that your pithiest posts do best in the morning, but your longer form videos are doing better later at night. Again, none of these are examples or rules, but they're the types of conclusions that can be sussed out through this type of analysis. And in our last section together, I wanted to explore a few trends and best practices and examples to help guide your content creation and set expectations for some of your analysis. These are just a few uh, major trends that we're seeing in our own analyses right now. 
A major trend is that engagement rate varies depending on a whole host of factors. Uh, this chart notes engagement rate across post formats for a variety of CI clients uh, as an average for engagement rates across formats as well as a few formats themselves. So what we have here is 3% average engagement rate across post formats, but that's a little bit higher for albums at 4%, lower for photo posts at 3%, and at its highest for video at 5%. The recommendation here is to create these benchmarks for your content, not just overall, but when you break them down into your frequently used categories. This is, this is the difference between looking at your own data and saying, wow, my video is always outperforming other posts. It's really above average. But if it's at 4% and your data breaks down this way, it's not really above average if video is usually at 5%. So it just lets you get a little bit more granular so that you can set expectations for yourself and stronger benchmarks for yourself so that you're really paying attention to, to the nuance and how users are responding to your different types of content. The second overall trend is that variety is key. Uh, over the last few months, a lot of organizations have developed really fantastic series-based content. We're talking about either weekly, daily, monthly, recurring live events, videos, photos, online classes. But without variety in the way that those posts are composed, we tend to see declining engagement rates. If you have very formulaic uh, layout and not much happening in between, users can start to lose interest if they begin to recognize something too frequently. We found that posts succeed best when series are broken up by different content. So let's take this example from the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. On the left, you can see a screenshot of their series called Musician Monday. They post these each Monday. They do incredibly well. Sometimes their engagement rates are as high as 20%. And these static images are broken up by different content on the days that follow. So that by the next time you get back to a Musician Monday, it, is, it feels like a new piece of content again. So the screen recording over on the right just gives you a sense of that. Next, you see an Instagram TV video from a live stream. After that, you have a musician playing a piece. The next post after that is a static image thanking users for participating in a live stream. And then we're up to our next Musician Monday. So because it's not the only type of content they're creating and publishing, it keeps it from feeling repetitive or monotonous, and it gives users reasons to engage with the series itself and with additional content. And lastly, content analysis really hammers home the impact of social best practices. The data is able to show us and prove the impact of using recommended content creation strategies. These best practices are, you know, they encapsulate a lot of different techniques. It might be really carefully crafted copy that is specific for social media, really appealing visuals, and content that's relevant to what's going on in the world. We tend to refer to this last one as the social sweet spot. So that's where the world and your organization meet. And that's where really meaningful content can be created. So to close, let's look at three examples of posts that do just that and then dig into some of the insights that organic social analysis is able to provide to show us why those approaches are working. First up on the left, we have an Instagram carousel from Cincinnati Playhouse in the park. Here we can see a variety of different production photos and they're celebrating International Day of Friendship. It says, cheers to International Day of Friendship. Take a look back at some of our favorite shows that feature besties, squads, and dynamic duos. This post did incredibly well. A lot of the actors uh, were actually tagged in it and responding to it. A lot of people then engaged with those comments. It drove about a 2% higher engagement rate than many of their other Instagram posts during that period of time in the months that preceded and followed, uh, largely due to its structure and its adherence to those best practices. In the center, we have an example from Discovery Place Science. There's copy here that reads, whether you're working from home, entertaining, or hanging out, let our reef rubble community tank relax you with a wave emoji and a really stunning visual of the tank. So again, much like the last post, we have really relevant copy. It's talking about what's going on in the world. It's published right towards the end of March. So it was when a lot of people were either working from home or staying at home more than they had previously. In this case, being able to hit that social sweet spot helped them drive upwards of 90 post shares, which was 14 times more than shares on their other posts in the surrounding weeks. And third, we have an example from the Dance Theater of Harlem from a video titled Dancing Through Harlem. This one has some audio, so I'm just gonna play it quickly and then we can chat. So 
So again, this video feels highly relevant. It feels like it was made for today, really because it was. You know, dancers are wearing masks, they're distanced from one another. Uh, the video was posted previously and then actually went viral on Twitter. So they posted it to Instagram and the response was pretty immediate. It drove upwards of a 25% engagement rate, which is just phenomenal, and over 500 shares on Facebook pretty much immediately. So of course, you can see that a lot of these posts do hit those best practices. Clear tone, attention grabbing visuals, very timely, very relevant. And of course, there are other factors at play as well. You know, We don't know exactly what time of day could have impacted this from some of the slides we talked about previously. But then once you're able to, to dig into the data, it's about more than checking boxes on those best practices, right? You're not just following content guidelines. You can see the story that you're able to tell about user engagement based on knowing that following some of these guidelines ends up driving really strong results, really great engagement rates, uh, immense viral reach. And it certainly can have an impact. A little bit of analysis can go a long way. And so I hope that some of these tips have helped start you in the right direction. Uh, so with that, I say thank you. Uh, here's my email address in case you have any questions. I'm always happy to talk about organic social content. It's one of my favorite topics. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Jess. That was phenomenal. Uh, lots of questions in the, the activity feed that we will get to. Uh, next up is our Capacity Interactive colleague, Daniel Titmus, and our new interpreter. Um, our interpreter, let's just give a shout out to our ASL interpreters who just add so much to, to the feed here. Thank you for being here. Um, so Daniel Tipness, welcome. Dan works on all things related to Google search engine and will show you how to create content for relevant topics that people are searching for right now, including digital programming. Welcome, Dan. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Uh, my name is Dan Titmus. I'm a white male with brown hair and glasses, wearing a plaid shirt, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm speaking to you from Astoria in New York City, and I want to acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Muncie Lenape Nation. So, you've all heard about SEO, and you know you need to be doing it, right? For those of us who might need a reminder, SEO is all about increasing the amount of traffic to your site, from the organic section of search engines rather than the ads. So this is the part underneath the ads, uh, which are right at the top of the search engine results page. Um, it's the thing that people come to the search engine for, is those organic results. Uh, oh, when we say uh, search engines, we're really just talking about one. Uh, here's a screenshot of Google, uh, just to subtly hint which one I'm talking about there. And so for a bunch of all arts organizations, SEO can be that thing in the background that you kind of file away and never get around to. Uh, it's a daunting task that can seem never ending uh, because it kind of is. SEO is a lot like working on your garden. Um, for those of us in New York, have been told a garden is a lot like a park, but it's only for you. Um, this is why I've got a picture of gardening up on screen here. And like gardening, SEO takes a lot to start, as it often requires overhauling all the technical stuff on the site and making sure everything's working correctly. And then it takes a lot of uh, constant pruning and upkeep to make sure everything is continuing to work. But we aren't here to talk about all of that today. Um, we're just going to chat about content and how to pick and create content. This will be less about gardening and more about how to select a single plant, I guess. You're going to hear a lot of tortured metaphors from me today in the session, so just buckle in. I'm warning you now. Uh, just a note, we're going to be focused on non-branded SEO here. When we think about SEO, you think about it in two different buckets. Branded SEO is about appearing for search terms that contain your brand name. For example, a specific theater in New York would want to appear at the top of the search engine results page, also known as the SERP, S-E-R-P, for anything to do with their brand. Non-branded SEO, on the other hand, is about introducing people to your organization. And it doesn't include your brand name. It can be hard to rank for some of those terms, like theater in New York, for example. There's a bunch of theaters that are all in New York. So Google has a harder time trying to pick which one out of all those uh, different organizations to present for the term theater in New York. Um, and also, they're all competing for it. And so we need to find other keywords that might just be a little bit easier to rank for. This is uh, that's what non-branded SEO is all about. It's about creating content that will introduce users to your site. Non-branded content, uh, non-branded SEO needs content. We need to be able to identify a keyword to target and create content to answer that query. 
So where do we start? It can be easy to get writer's block, especially if this is the first time you've ever created SEO content. Often, but not always, your content will live on a blog on your site. And blogs are often thought of as uh, patron facing with titles like, you know, read about the new season from our artistic director or other in the weeds topics. Um, writing blog content for SEO is different than writing blog content for patrons. And then we actually have to start from what users are searching for. This process is called keyword research. Essentially, we're trying to think about what users are gonna be searching for, and then we're gonna narrow down our options. So the best way to do this is to think about it in three distinct phases. Firstly, you have the inspiration phase, then you have the research phase, and then the selection phase, uh, slash writing, I guess, as well. Um, let's start with that first, that first bit, the inspiration phase, uh, where we're trying to think of as many keywords or search terms as possible to do with our chosen subject. Whether that is a show you're presenting, you know, your genre in general, ballet, theater, postmodern political French puppetry, um, or even like an aspect of your organization that you want to promote, like education or maybe some classes that you're presenting. Um, the thing I recommend here is getting into a room, Zoom or otherwise, probably Zoom for the foreseeable future, and just writing down any and all information, any search that can possibly you know, have relevance to the thing you are trying to write a piece of content for. You know, anything that you would want to appear at the top of the search engine results page for. And there are some really, really good tools you can use for inspiration here. The first one is Google's autocomplete, right at the top of the SERP or the search engine results page. So here we've just got a screenshot of that autocomplete um, box right on top of the um, search engine where it's, complete, uh, it's completing the terms for can cats eat, and then it will complete it with salami. Can cats eat peanut butter? Can cats eat bananas? Um, this gives you a really good insight into what people are thinking of, right? Uh, this, is, this is what people are searching for. People are searching for these terms. So creating content for them kind of makes sense. Um, you know, I'm not sure why people are searching for all this stuff, like can cats eat chocolate and watermelons and bananas and eggs and salami, but um, I'll let you research that on your own time. Another thing we can look at is at the bottom of the search engine results page, Google's suggested searches. Um, so here we've got, once you make the search, other searches that might be related to that search. Uh, here someone has searched, can dogs eat spaghetti? And these other search, relevant search terms have appeared. So can dogs eat cheese? Can dogs eat tomatoes? All those are relevant to that original search term that they were searching for. Having owned a dog that is like less than well behaved, I can tell you that most of these searches will be frantic, sort of panicked, retroactive searches after the dog has eaten said tomatoes, cheese, and potatoes and rice. Uh, let's look at something that's not to do with uh, dogs eating uh, spaghetti. Uh, let's look at like a more relevant example for the arts. So here we've got a screenshot of um, the autocomplete with the term classical music. The autocomplete here, I think is really insightful, right? People are searching for information about all of this different stuff. So classical music composers. Let's take that as an example. We can see how we could create an article to answer that query. This is a list of classical music composers or a sort of, these are the most important classical music composers of the last 400 years, um, something like that. We can create something to answer that. It's one of the, the classical music for studying. We can create a sort of like list of uh, classical music pieces that are really, really good for, for studying. And the suggested search is here. Um, again, this is really good insight into what people are thinking about and what they're searching for. A lot of these are actually fairly similar to the autocomplete here, but let's look at one, the classical music piano there. So I can see an article that would be sort of answering that query that would be something like, you know, the most iconic piano pieces in classical music um, or something, something like that. You can see how, you know, you can take these queries and then answer them in a piece of content. There's also a, another tool I find really, really useful that I love called Answer the Public. So here we're just uh, clicking through to answer the public um, and we're greeted with this guy who can see into your soul. Um, and what we're gonna do is just type something in here and he's gonna watch you because he knows you're typing, it's pretty creepy. I'm gonna type in classical music and press the search button. He knows, he's smiling. Um, so basically when we click through it, it let, waits for a little bit to load and then it gives you all of these questions that people have actually searched for you know will classical music make you smarter um where is classical music from uh, what classical music is public domain 
all really, really, really great questions that can inspire a piece of organic content based on something that people are actually searching for. I just uh, picked out a few examples. I really like them. I'm just going to go through here. So let's look at this one. How classical music affects the brain. So this is one of the uh, most common answers. This is one of the, the um, queries that was uh, that came up in that in that uh, classical music search I just did on Answer the Public. So we can look at that and think, you know, answer that with a piece of content that you know summarizes all of those classical music studies that have um, talked about you know effects on the on the on brain and brain chemistry and how people you know react to, to classical music. I think that'd be a really interesting piece of content. Let's look at a few more. When was classical music popular? Um, so even like questions that you wouldn't think are, are you know, uh, might, be, might feel like obvious to answer, we can, we can see them in the search engine sort of results, in, in, the, in those results from Answer the Public, and we can try and answer them. You know, I can see here like a, a piece about, um, you know, the, when did the, the, the concept of classical music start and when did the class, concept of modern music start? It's also some more depressing ones into what people are thinking of. Will classical music survive? Um, but it's not just that it gives out. So Answer the Public also gives out comparisons. So you've got classical music like Peter and the Wolf. So if you're presenting you know, uh, Peter and the Wolf at your organization, then you can create a piece of content that answers this question of classical music like Peter and the Wolf, either you know, a bunch of classical music pieces that are based on like animals and how they sound, or um, are based on like a narrative story. Um, you can see how you can like, sort of adapt that to a piece of content. We've also got classical music versus modern music. I can see here like a, what would be good would be to have like an infographic. So an infographic that compares each one on, on different sides. Infographics are a really nice piece of uh, SEO content because they're often shared a lot of different places. And so people are linking to you, which adds your search authority. Um, it also completes for every letter. So classical music A, classical music B, classical music C, and then completes the word based on that. So this is the one that I saw for D that popped out. Classical music, dun, 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 dun. Uh, so we can create a piece of music to answer that implicit question of what is the piece of music that goes dun, 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 dun. Um, so yeah. So once you're done getting your list of keywords, we need to find, we need to start to make a selection. What we're looking for here is search queries that have a lot of search volume, but balance that out with low competition. That's why I've got this bird here kind of balancing between two things, because that kind of represents the term balance. Um, for example, if you're a theater, you might think the term play is a relevant term that you should target, right? After all, you put on plays. There are references to plays throughout your site. It's, for all intents and purposes, supremely relevant, right? However, the term play is ridiculously competitive by itself. There are a bunch of organizations, including music streaming companies, video game producers, alongside other theaters who are trying to rank for this term, or may just naturally be ranking with not much effort. Similarly, the term Bertolt Breck play written for the modern age set in Ohio and playing in New York is a very specific term, right? If we wanted to rank for that term, we definitely could. But nobody's searching for that, right? So we have to find a middle ground something like best political plays or what is Bertolt Brecht best known for? You know? There are a bunch of ways to do this. The simplest is literally just a gut feeling. And lots of SEO professionals will clutch their pearls at this while not admitting that it's still a valid thing to do and something they do do. Um, if it's a really common question um, and you know that as, from your organization and it doesn't have a good answer on the la like on the it doesn't have a good um, listing on this on the search engine results page, and it's something you can easily write up and put online. Put up, see what happens. Um, but most of the time, you probably want to go, go and do a little bit more research on volume and competition, just to make sure you know the time you're spent creating content is best used. It's where another free tool comes in, Google Ads. So here we just got a screenshot of a, a, a free tool on Google Ads called the Keyword Planner. Um, and what you do with this tool is you put in uh, a list of different phrases. So classical music on YouTube, uh, classical music best, uh, for example. And then the uh, keyword planner will give you the average monthly searches and the competition level for each of those different, key, uh, each of those different phrases or keywords. Um, 
And so here we can just see that, you know, the volume over time for all the all the different uh, phrases I've put in. And I've just sorted it by average monthly searches. Um, a few notes on this. It is specific to paid search data. So it isn't like a like for like tool. Um, but it's, a, you know, it's a good estimate of how organic data will behave. And a lot of um, a lot of search engine optimization professionals use this. Um, yeah. Another tool you can use, another free tool is uh, Google Trends. So um, this is just a screenshot of Google Trends, which basically you can put any phrase into and it will give you the organic traffic over however long you put in. Uh, so here we can see that I put in things to do at home and there's been a spike in traffic uh, for this phrase around mid-March in uh, New York. I uh, don't know what that could have been. Um, once you have your keyword selected, you know, you've done your research or you've decided on a topic, it's time to get writing. But before that, we've got to decide where it will live. Uh, and I like to think of adding content to the site as falling into one of two buckets, the magazine or encyclopedia. The magazine approach is more of a casual search specific approach, right? It can focus on questions or highlight a list of facts. Uh, most of the time, this will appear on a blog on your site. Right? The encyclopedia approach is slightly different. Right? Think of this as more of a list of resources um, available for if people were to search for anything to do with your genre, like your very own Wikipedia. Um, this will likely be under its own particular section of the site under resources or education. Um, obviously, it varies site by site and genre by genre. Uh, let's look at a couple of examples then. So uh, this is sort of the magazine approach. So here I'm searching for Beethoven symphonies. And it also looks like I've searched for a uh, beetle that looks like a bee, because um, that's something that I saw. And some bad news just popped up on, on screen. So I'm just going to swipe that away. Um, so we're going to go down here and find a guide to Beethoven symphonies. So this is a article created by Carnegie Hall, which basically is just a list of um, of all the Beethoven symphonies and a sort of like a summary of each one. Um, it's a really, really nice bit of content because it answers that implicit question of what are the Beethoven symphonies? Uh, you know, or it answers that query of Beethoven symphonies. Um, but it is formatted in like a magazine approach here rather than an encyclopedia approach. Uh, you know, you could find this in a classical music magazine. Um, so let's think about the encyclopedia approach as well. Um, so here I have just searched uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, um, and we'll be so we we'll met with like a really nice um, search engine results page with lots of information on. Um, and we can go down. We can find um, a piece, uh, like a, a bio that's been written by the Broad Museum. So here is um, all about you know the history um, of the artist and you know important pieces. Um, Really interesting information, uh, it's, uh, but it's a focus more on the encyclopedia approach, right? This will be found in like an art or our artists or collection um, section. So once you've decided what you're going to write and you know where it's going, uh, guess what? You got to uh, you got to start writing. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go too deep into this, um, but essentially write enough content to cover the topic in detail. Um, there's this number of like 700 to 1200 words, very loose guide. Um, the most important thing, avoid overwriting and most important, and also avoid underwriting. Um, but most importantly, um, write for humans, not robots. It can be so tempting to overthink your article and try to write for the Google algorithms. Like, don't do this, right? Google spends billions on making sure that their search results present the best possible matches for humans. Uh, this is a key tentpole in their business model. If their search engine just gave results that are weird articles written for robots that are just stuffed with keywords, um, nobody would use their search engine and they wouldn't be able to sell ads. So it's in their best interest, it's in your best interest to write for your audience, um, write for humans. It, if possible, make it visual. Um, that's sort of another really good tip. You know, more images makes for a better article. And then if you have a better article, Google is more likely to rank it. Um, more images can help with you on the, on the technical side as well. Speaking of which, let's try and get the technical stuff right. Um, technical SEO uh, can include a whole range of things. You can really go down the rabbit hole with schema, tags, markup. Um, 
a bunch of other things. So when I say get the technical stuff right, that can be kind of impossible because there's always more stuff to do. Um, instead, we need to focus on you know getting the technical stuff not wrong. Um, if you're writing SEO content, it's important to have a checklist in mind. For many SEO professionals, this can be extremely long and complicated, but you can make an impact by just focusing on a couple of key SEO details. Um, so here we've just got the top two, title tags and meta descriptions. Um, and I'll just provide an example here. Uh, we have characters in Don Quixote Ballet. So we've got um, a piece here from Ballet Met, which is just meet the characters of Don Quixote. Um, and we can look at the title tag and meta descriptions that are gonna help out, that we can put on the page that Google will take to present this listing on the search engine results page. So here, the title tag, meet the characters of Don Quixote Ballet Met. Now, we can put the phrase, the phrase in here of characters of Don Quixote Ballet is in there. Um, so that's a really, really well-designed title tag. But it also thinks about click-through rate. It's meet the characters of Don Quixote Ballet Met, right? It, you're being called to do something. The words you put into a title tag affect the ranking. So Google looks at those and... And that, that can affect where Google places you on the search engine results page. Um, it also affects click-through rate. And then the meta description, which creates the, the little description underneath, that only affects click-through rate. Um, but then you know, click-through rate also affects ranking. So it eventually affects ranking, but not in the same way a title tag does. And the meta description isn't always used in full. So here, um, the meta description has been sort of partly used. We've got the meet some characters of Don Quixote with insight from a few of our dancers performing the roles, but the rest of it is filled with other information. Um, but still very, very useful to have, and it will appear on most, most, um, most listings on a SERP. Um, and you know, if you have a really, really good piece of content that answers a question very well, then it can appear in search snippets as well. So search snippets are that the bit of information right at the top of the search engine results page that provide the information without you having to click through, um, which is a really, really valuable thing to have. So here we've got Don Quixote Ballet characters, and they're already right here on the search engine results page. Um, and even though people aren't necessarily clicking through to your site, still an important thing. It's lending to your authority um, for like the domain authority for, for, for the search engine. Um, algorithms uh, and it is also you know it's also a branding exercise you know by this answer we have the you know ballet met right there um so that is that is kind of it i guess if i had to summarize i would basically say you know find a piece of content make sure it's seo focused it comes from a a search query and then uh, get to writing and finally keep writing um that's my email there if anyone ever wants to talk uh, nerdy seo stuff i'm Always happy to do so. So shoot me an email. That was great, Dan. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you at the the Q and A in a sec. This train train moves quick, so um, I'm going to introduce our third speaker, Ben Jones. Ben runs the Unskippable Labs team at Google, which designs experiments to explore the future of advertising. And Ben's going to share with us some new research on the value of diversity in ads, building new audiences, and unearthing opportunities for video experimentation. Welcome to Bootcamp, Ben. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'll start out by saying that uh, I am a white man with uh, glasses on and uh, brown hair with more than a whisper of gray. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, and I am coming to you from southern Vermont. Uh, the tribe in this region was the Sokoki, which is an Abenaki tribe. And I'm, uh, I'm proud to say that the Abenaki have been uh, coming back in Vermont, uh, recognized uh, by the state government. They were starting to teach the language in schools, um, and uh, their language Language is on the on the verge of, of dying out. So uh, Vermont, after a long history of, of of acting poorly, is beginning to recognize their responsibility. Uh, and so we honor the presence of of the Sokoki in particular and the Abenaki generally on this land. 
Um, as I was preparing for this presentation, I was uh, listening to a podcast from Sam Mendez and Team Deacons, Roger Deacons and his wife, James. This is a photo of them on the set of 1917. Uh, and uh, Sam was talking about the difference between film and theater and uh, sitting in a theater on opening night as the house lights go down, and this uh, human electricity that runs through the crowd that so many of you are, are familiar with, and you immediately knowing whether uh, the creative choices that you've made have been successful or not. Um, I think one of the magical things about uh, the digital opportunity or the digital age is that we, while we're not sitting in the theater, the, the access to that kind of listening is available. Um, and we're understanding in new ways, the way that people are responding to content, what they're paying attention to, and the kinds of things that we can learn from them. So I'm gonna share some pieces of that with you now. They're focused on uh, belief and behavior in uh, in the time of COVID, the reactions of advertisers, and then and then some ways to move through them. But I thought it was just wonderful to think about getting closer to the human electricity. Of of course, we can't do it, but being live in the in the theater. And I highly recommend the the Team Deacons podcast if you guys are looking for additional content to pay attention to. It's great. Um, there was a moment when uh, COVID really ramped up, and it varied by geography. My my team is global, so we had a chunk in Asia, and then uh, obviously in in Europe, Northern Italy in particular, and then in the U.S. Um, and teams around the world turned to us and said, "You know, what can you tell us? What does the data say? What insights can you have?" Uh, and in that moment, there was no data. Uh, we did not have a pattern of precedence uh, to fall back on. Uh, and what's fascinating to me is in that moment when we had no data, how did we respond to this overwhelming human experience? W what message did we put out and how did we decide to, to represent our organizations, our products, our brands? Um, unfortunately, we made uh, largely, and in some cases almost literally, the same ad. The images here reflect clips of stock photos that were used by major global brands. Uh, the same photo in multiple ads, the same music backing track in multiple ads. Uh, each brand was trying so hard to connect on a human level that the brands themselves disappeared. And it, it, it's understandable. It was a, a, an unbelievable sort of common human moment and we did not have data or experience. But for me, it showed this, this combination of data and imagination that we all need if we're gonna help our organizations that we work for thrive and survive and create connection to the audiences that we seek. Uh, so how have we moved forward since then? Well, we've started to get some data in and seen some patterns in that data. Uh, and so I'm gonna show you uh, some, some lenses on that that are hopefully helpful for, for you as you think about your own organizations. Um, so what are we seeing now? We're seeing consumers moving into what we're calling life after sweatpants, uh, and maybe not entirely after sweatpants, but but big tranches of behavior change that we've seen. So from February to April, uh, broadly speaking, was a time of intense anxiety. We didn't know what was gonna happen. Uh, we didn't know how COVID was spread. We didn't know its implications and we didn't know what safe behaviors were. April and May, we start to see adjustment in behaviors. Okay, I found, however temporarily, a kind of new normal, but still in crisis mode, um, and the things that people are searching for and the activities that they're engaging in um, are in this mode of sort of stabilization. Uh, over the course of the summer and into the fall, with a big shift for, for back to school, we're starting to find rhythms of our behaviors. So the elements of our behaviors that are more sustained uh, and planning to change, those that we are adapting to old patterns and those that, um, that are entirely new to us. And we think in late 2020, hopefully, um, and into 2021, we'll start to see more sustained adaptation. But these patterns are important because they speak to the emotional state of consumers, and we, they also speak to the sort of time horizon that consumers are able to see. And in February, April time period, people were looking out a week, two weeks, three weeks, April, May, it's starting to be six weeks, you start to see a little bit more planning and anticipation. Uh, now we're looking out sort of two to three months um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to get back into a place where we can see in a longer time horizon. Um, 
How are we seeing behaviors change? We're seeing three broad patterns. Uh, it was actually interesting to see the, the uh, Google Trends chart that Dan showed, which is a perfect example of a shock behavior. These, these lines that you see after the words shock, step change, and speed up are literally the shape of Google Trends curves. So we see some behaviors that are shock behaviors that suddenly change very abruptly. Um, for example, how to, uh, how to teach children at home. Um, that is an abrupt shock and then levels back out. We see what we think of as step change behavior. So we're sort of operating at a, at a common level. Then there was a big change and that level of change has sustained. I would say exercise routines or cooking at home are a good example of those. And then we see speed up. These are behaviors that were already growing or accelerating that got a huge boost um, and continue to sustain at high levels. These are things like uh, e-commerce um, or, uh, um, or uh, education, distance learning, education, um, or delivery services. So these are things that were already in, in process. As you think about your own businesses, and the ways that you can connect people to, to the organizations that you represent, it's important to have a look at these things. There are actually huge opportunities in the, in the shock moments. For example, teach at home because arts education has fallen away. There is an opportunity for people with a dire need. There is a hole in the market, and that may be something that you can respond to, but it requires a very rapid response um, and a change of your organization in a way that maybe you have not been anticipating. Step change starts to be more interesting. You can plan for it, resource against it, um, and, and have a little bit more time, and then speed up. This is looking at your business and saying, where do we play in this ecosystem, and how should we shift resources to, to better reflect this change of behaviors. Um, there are two really key shifts that we see uh, out of the pattern of data um, that are important for our decision making. We created a little framework. Uh, the first of those is the shift from a third space, uh, which was famously popularized by Starbucks, to a third of the space. We've come into our domestic spaces, and we are working in those domestic spaces. Um, all of our productivity is there, education is there, and so our space becomes much, much, much more constrained. But within that space and that range of activities, there are also uh, new kinds of time because we don't have to travel from one space to, a next, to the next. And so a shift of time and space and our perceptions of those things is, is happening. At the same time, we're seeing a transition from, uh, is it safe to, is it worth it? So people are starting to uh, negotiate themselves to say, this behavior, is it a binary yes or no to this behavior? Uh, is the value of it or is the is what I'm going to get from it worth the risk that I'm exposing myself to? So a, a subtle evolution there in terms of how people are thinking about how they're spending their time. Um, this is a complicated, a complicated chart, but this idea of the spaces getting smaller and cozier, and the things that are being crammed into a home, compressed into uh, compressing life, leisure, public, and private altogether. Um, and then you can see on the right-hand side here uh, a set of searches that have had more than 10x growth from 2019 to 2020. So uh, some unsurprising things: food and groceries, hobbies and leisure, family and community entertainment, health, personal care, the lens of all of these things are changing to what comes into my home, how do I experience them in my home, um, and, and what opportunity is there to do that. Uh, at the same time, this transition from is it safe to is it worth it, uh, we're finding is, is an internal decision. Um, that is, even after lockdowns are lifted, people are evaluating their own behaviors and the pattern of changing their behaviors is not directly connected to when governments shift in and out of lockdown. So if you look here, this is data from India, Mexico, and the US. What are the changes of activity levels um, after uh, lockdowns are lifted versus the baseline? And obviously we know from, from the US, this is state by state. It's almost week by week. Uh, unfortunately, as we seem to be entering a third wave, um, maybe even day by day. Um, but it's important to note that this is as, as internal a process as it is external. We aren't necessarily trusting what's been told to us and adjusting our behavior accordingly. Um, we're, we're managing internally against that. So we see four sort of um, four sort of ways of thinking about consumers. On one axis, there is a mindset of, 
is it worth it? These are people who are more open and, and assessing risk as they decide what they're going to do versus is it safe, more cautious? Um, and then the access, uh, uh, horizontal access from third space, I'm definitely going to do it at home to the third space. I want to be out. I want to be somewhere that's not home or work. So in the upper left quadrant, we can see folks who are broadly speaking optimistic, um, but still uh, at home. So they're evaluating uh, risks of uh, activities they may engage in, but they're still largely focused on home. You want to excite them. You want to be, be. You want to offer something that's going to continue to inspire them to tip over that. Uh, is it worth? Uh, is it worth it question? Uh, on the upper right, these are folks who are open. They are uh, moving out into the world and they are evaluating the, the opportunities there. And so you want to inspire them. What can I do? Where can I go? The messaging for, for that set of folks is going to be quite different. Um, and then on the is it safe side in the lower left corner, uh, the people who are at home and asking is it safe, they really need very fundamental reassurance. So if it's a service proposition, how you're sanitizing safety protocols, um, all of the things that are going to start to move them uh, into a more open mindset. And in the bottom right, people who are uh, still very cautious, probably engaging in outdoor activities, but not around other folks to say, OK, we need to convince them that this is a place where you can continue to be safe, um, but you can be out in the world. So four different kinds of mindset that offer uh, opportunities for messaging um, that we're seeing starting to emerge. What are we seeing happen creatively? This was a most urgent question we got. How do I need to change my ads? Can I show people out together? Can I show them touching their faces? Do they need to have face masks on? Can I show groups of people? To what extent do I need to exactly mirror what people are experiencing around me in order to communicate uh, effectively? For this, we did a review of uh, a little over 3,000 ads globally comparing a year ago to this year through uh, two different periods in the year. The good news is that uh, normal ads are still working. Uh, I think we over-indexed on the idea that we needed to change what we showed. Um, you can show in ads normal people engaged in normal activities out with their friends in their communities eating food, enjoying performances, visiting museums. Um, pe people are able to, to take in those things and understand that it is an ad and those experiences are available without finding such a big disconnect to their day-to-day -day life. Um, the only exception there is if you have a service proposition, uh, contactless delivery, for example, or, or virtual meetings, virtual lectures, et cetera. Those kinds of things obviously you need to communicate, but you don't need to over-index on tone. You can, you can show uh, the story of the experience you want to present in the way that you would previously. So that's good news. Uh, part one, I think it gives a lot of, of storytelling that allows people to speak more directly about their brand, which leads to the second. Uh, a lot of people in an attempt to tell a story about COVID and the time of COVID lost track of their brand. Um, and so even though they made stories that were moving, nobody afterwards said, oh, that was, uh, you know, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra or that was um, this performing arts organization, this museum. You need to be you and you need to be recognizably you. And as you think about where you take communications risk, staying closer to who you are is more important than imagining that you can tell a story that, that any uh, a, a range of other organizations could tell. Third, we're starting to see an after emerging uh, slowly. Um, we're starting to see uh, patterns of behavior shift back. So in the spring, famously, um, uh, some, some analysts noticed that there had been 10 years of progression in e-commerce between March uh, and May. So in three months, we had this explosion of e-commerce. Um, that e-commerce wave is subsiding now as people have the opportunity to go to stores and feel safer uh, as stores are stocked differently. Um, and so this after is emerging and it's not clear what it's gonna mean for holiday experience, for, for groups, um, et cetera. Um, but we are seeing that this after period, right? Life after sweatpants, this is it worth it? Behaviors are starting to emerge and consumers are responding to them uh, differently. Uh, this is a complicated chart that talks about the time and cost needed to produce ads, the amount of creative change, and the set of choices you can think about making. You can make a new ad without 
doing a new shoot without creating new content. So for something as simple or simple as adding or changing supers or a voiceover, um, you can you can create a different message and you can communicate in a different way. You can do a small edit. You can do creative reuse or remix, especially of existing footage and new footage or new footage and stock footage. Um, so there are a lot of creative opportunities that allow you to uh, cheaply produce new content and to message effectively. It's fascinating for me as I as I talk to organizations like yours, uh, and, and the message I most frequently get is, oh, it's great to see what these big brands are doing, but our brand, we don't have those those kind of resources or that kind of that kind of money to invest or the production quality, et cetera. Um, when you look at a thousand ads in the in a row, the thing that you see is that production quality um, and and expensive high production values are not a differentiator in performance. Uh, it is compelling content, human stories, um, and and the ability to connect to an audience. So there is just as much chance. Uh, of a small organization uh, telling a great story to connect as there is for uh, for a Nike or a Procter & Gamble or a Universal Studios. Um, so good opportunities and, and opportunities to, to make change cheaply uh, to connect to audiences and consumers as their behavior shifts. Um, one of the challenges on the production side is that I see uh, these production companies being incredibly resourceful to mask the fact that they have constraints rather than thinking about the kinds of stories that they could tell because of those constraints. Um, our audiences have never been more forgiving. They understand we're at home, there are restrictions, we can't get a lot of people together without risk. And so there is a, a whole new space of storytelling that is available to us. We have permission to do a new kind of storytelling, um, but only if we aren't trying to do the old kind of storytelling, just with superhuman effort to mask the fact that we have constraints. My favorite ad, I, I just talked about different uh, companies doing this. I'm gonna show you this Nike ad, um, which was done with all existing footage, right? This is just editing. It's a tremendous amount of editing. But when we saw this ad and it exploded globally, no one said, oh, I can't believe that they made this ad during a time of COVID, or I can't believe they made this ad out of stock footage. They said, this ad is amazing. It is amazing. And because there were not shoots available, um, there was just editing. That editing worked in a different, in a different sort of way. Uh, this visual, by the way, is a split screen ad that Nike used to combine two athletes together, mimicking in a very seamless way their, their motions. So where does that leave you with consumers that are that are changing very quickly and needing very specific kinds of, of messaging, uh, creative opportunities to tell new kinds of stories, um, and the challenge of knitting those together in a way when business constraints are, are uh, very dire for all of us? Um, it is to evolve through experimentation. There is not a body of data, patterns of data. I can't put up a best practices checklist for you for messaging to your consumers in your geography with your organization service product, however you think about how you're going to create that connection. Um, and so I'm going to share uh, just two stories of, of experimentation, uh, one small and one large. Um, my team started uh, by asking a very simple question. Would we pay attention to a face longer uh, or a place longer? This is a guy on our team. Uh, we shot 30 seconds of him drinking a cup of coffee against a wall no music, uh, no no sound, no script, no nothing, just him, 30 seconds. And then on the right, 30 seconds out of des our designer's window in, in Brooklyn. And you can see it's not a particularly beautiful landscape. And what we wanted to answer there was, um, will we pay attention to a face longer or a place longer? This is something you would never ask or explore in a broadcast with a ton of media, but we were able to find out overnight uh, for, for about $100 that we would pay attention to a face longer and proportionally longer on a mobile device. Um, and so as we go into major advertisers like a Ford or a General Motors or a Maserati, don't open your ad with a long, slow shot of the Pacific Coast Highway, uh, focus in on human and human experience. Um, and I say this to say, you know, this was a phone and a credit card and, and 24 hours. So you can ask questions in a different way. You can hear your audience 
uh, in a way that's much closer to a theater than, than it is to a broadcast world where you create a campaign uh, and run it for a long period of time. Um, the next experiment I'm going to show you, it's just interesting to see the kind of questions you can ask. This was an experiment we did with HBO for Westworld. Um, season one of Westworld was very focused on, uh, on um, it, it drew a core audience of Western and sci-fi fans, and they needed to draw a broader audience. And so we did an experiment with them. This was the control ad that we used. And you can see uh, on the left-hand side is, is the opening shot, right? This huge sweeping Western vista, and then almost a cliche of a Western and, and strong sci-fi signaling. Um, and what that meant is if I were not interested in Westerns or sci-fi, I would not be interested in the story that the trailer had to tell. And the trailer wove together many complicated uh, elements of story so that if you watched the whole thing from beginning to end, you got this picture of a very complex world. But that's not how people are choosing to pay attention to content now. They're deciding quicker, am I interested or am I not? If I'm interested, I'll watch a lot more. And if I'm not interested, I'm gonna shut it down. Uh, we say that attention spans are shrinking, but the opposite is exactly true. Uh, I was uh, I was uh, not surprised, although somewhat saddened, to see that uh, Quibi has gone or is headed uh, out of business, betting on the idea that attention spans are short and we want the short content. Um, on the other hand, we are in a golden age of binge watching and, and long form content. Um, my uh, my wife and I just just started The Sopranos last night, so no no spoilers no spoilers there. I I know what happens at the end. This was the control for Westworld. Um, we ran it against a series of audiences. And what was interesting is different content storytelling styles worked for different audiences. So this of eight trailers was the one most successful with female audience. Um, and it started with tight shots, not those big wide Western vistas. And it focused on one human story, not the whole story of Western and its robots and all of these levels of conflict, but the entire story through the eyes of Tandy Newton. And that drew in an audience and got them to choose to pay attention to the content and explore it and become much more engaged. So a single character at the center as opposed to the sweep of the entire story. Interestingly, for male drama fans, that is non-genre fans, the story was very different. Um, it told uh, the similarly similar, similar visual style, tight shots, but no story, just a sort of impressionistic feel of the show, uh, reinforced by the voices of critic and critics and driven by a kind of propulsive music in the background. So very different style of storytelling for a male and female audience. And when they uh, built the season two trailer, season three trailer on the top of these insights, they drew, successfully drew a significantly larger female audience. So through this kind of experimentation in a, in a narrowly focused way, you can unlock these insights that can open up real changes in your business. And we were thrilled to see, although we did not touch the work, um, that, that as HBO launched um, the final season of, of Game of Thrones, they leveraged those learnings there. They opened on a tight shot of a face. They started with a scene of intense action or emotion, and it was focused on a single character situation to draw people in. So it was not the sweep of the world. For the final season of Game of Thrones, where they could have told any story that they wanted, you know, we were we were very thrilled to see that they had taken advantage of the learnings that we had done together. And I think it demonstrates that that even for storytellers who can tell any story, um, these opportunities to experiment and learn uh, are available uh, and can be helpful. Um, we don't need to think about experimentation just being A, B messaging, um, but storytelling, storytelling style, uh, the kind of content that's available to your organizations can be very rich and very successful um, uh, in ways that may be, that may be unexpected. Um, that's what I have for you guys until the, until the Q&A, but, but thank you again for having me here. It's, it's my pleasure to be here. Ben, thank you so much for that. Uh, Felice, thanks for your um, interpretation. And uh, I'm gonna welcome back Jose, and we're gonna bring back um, Jess and Dan. Uh, we don't have a ton of time for questions, but um, there were a few, and that was such a great, um, in, you know, I just love how boot camp can go big picture and in the weeds, and all of you did such a tremendous job doing that. Um, here's an in the weeds question, and this is for Dan. Can you speak to SEO for video, especially on YouTube? We've been finding big organic growth in all video platforms, but so would love to ensure we're helping people find the content through search. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, YouTube or anything with the search bar at the top has a search engine, right? Seamless is a search engine. Um, so you're going to want to do everything you can to signal to the algorithms that are like, like sorting through all of, the, all of these different videos um, that you have relevant content and don't lie to it, essentially. Um, so, you know, make the file, make the file what, like the factual file name that you upload, have that, you know, have the relevant, uh, whatever the video is. You know, if it's a video of like Beethoven's Fifth, um, have that in the file name. Keep the title under 60 characters um, is usually a, a good thing to do. Um, I think the description you can have up to a thousand characters, um, but you only see the first hundred in the where, whenever you list it at. It's like listed out in the. the uh -huh. You all lose Dan as well. So I love. I, I was just noticing I have Dan a page SEO of YouTube. So that, We're in there. Sorry, I had a, a quick tech glitch. I was just, uh, when you were paused, uh, remarking that I asked you a very technical SEO question about YouTube when we have the head of Unskippable Labs from YouTube here above you. Um, <laughs> I don't know, Ben, if you wanted to add anything to that. Whoa, or... whoa, whoa. No, no, no. Dan, Dan knows much more about this stuff than I, I have a focus on a totally different part of the business. Dan, your presentation was super, super educational. I'm glad I could just steal the shape of the of the search curve uh, for my own. For my own. Okay. I'm glad I wasn't just followed up with, don't believe any of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, a quick one for Jess. What would you say is the uh, most effective campaign? I know this is a long question, but the highlights, what would you say is the most effective campaign or strategy when running Facebook ads for events? We typically run event response streaming campaigns, but those don't always translate to ticket sales. Is there a better funnel? We operate with social ad budgets varying from 100 to to $1,000, depending on the event. Sure. Um, I'm going to steal a little bit of what I think Mark Schaefer said today, which is that with all things in marketing, it depends. Um, I would say event response can be a really great strategy for selling tickets. But if I were to guess, maybe there's a little bit of a follow up that needs to happen there. So, you know, we always like to structure our Facebook campaigns with the goal and the optimization in mind for like what you really want to happen. Um, so if event response isn't your final goal, it shouldn't probably be the final step of the campaign. Maybe you want to end with a couple of days where you're only targeting people who responded to that event and driving them to the website to buy tickets with a different structured ad. Maybe you don't have the ability based on budget to run that long of a campaign. So you want to be posting more frequently within the event itself to drive people to purchase tickets. So I think there are ways to work with that. No one objective or goal is going to solve all the problems. Um, but you want to be thinking about like what that final step is so that if people have taken that action, you can drive them to the place you want them to be. Great. And in our final minute, Ben, how do we continue to create space for a variety of reactions while actively promoting safe behavior and not normalizing our country's disastrous non-policies surrounding the deadly pandemic? <laughs> Just solve that one in one minute. Wow, yeah, no, I got this, I got this. I'll, I'll, I'll give back the final 30 seconds and let me just say that's an, an incredibly complex question. I think the way that I would come at it is to say, number one, we have the ability to target very narrowly and so we can think about specifically groups that are not at risk or areas that are not at risk and, and be very focused on them instead of broad. Um, and, and secondly, in terms of thinking about that change of time and space, right? We have more time in a way that we that we haven't had before, but it's a different kind of time. It's more intimate, likely to be more at home, um, and likely to be more, unfortunately, anxiety filled, especially over the next couple of weeks. So, think about targeting and how you can serve a small a smaller group of people maybe really well, and uh, and stay safe. Yeah. Jess, Dan, Ben, uh, Jose, thank you so so much. This is great. Thank you guys for having us, Jose. It was hypnotic to watch you. I just could, was having trouble speaking because it's so fun to just see you do your thing. It's magic. Yeah, it adds, adds, adds so much for, for everybody. Yeah. Um, all right, we stretched our digital marketing muscles. Now it's time to stretch our bodies. I can't wait. I'm pleased to welcome Akua Noni Parker, who is a dancer, teacher, model, and chef. Akua has performed as a leading company member with Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, Dance Theater of Harlem, Cincinnati Ballet, and Ballet San Jose. She joined us at our boot camp live stream in April for an amazing stretch break, and I'm so pleased to welcome her back to lead us in some movement. 
Hi, Akua. Hi. <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you. Nice to see you too. I'm, I'm so going, excited. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, perfect. So like Eric said, my name is Akua Noni Parker. I uh, have my preferred pronoun pronouns are she and her. Um, I have blonde hair up in a bun and braids, and it's shaved all the way around the back and the sides, just playing with my hairstyles. Um, I'm coming to you from the Bronx in New York, which is previously the territory of the Suinoi indigenous people. So I'm excited to lead you in a stretch class. So let's get started really quickly. If you have a, uh, a chair or even your desk you can use. If you want to hold on, just have it there and we'll um, grab onto it whenever you need. So we're just going to start by just giving our hands a really rigorous shake for 10 seconds. Just shake for 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, keep shaking, 5, 4, three, two, and one. And just relax. Now close your eyes and we'll do a quick body scan from the bottom to the top. Start at your feet and your ankles. You can already feel your hands up to your knees and your quads, your hips, up through your center, front and back, your spine, up through your shoulders, your neck, your chin, your mouth. You can open your eyes and let it all out your head. From there, we're going to take head rolls to the right and back and left and down. Three more, right and back, left, and down, just let it all go, right, back, left, and down, one more, right, back, left, and down, reverse, left, back, right, and down, left, back, right, and down, two more, left, back, Open your chest, right and down. Last one, left and back and right and down. Coming up from here, we will raise our shoulders up like earrings and then just relax them. Again, make tension in your shoulders, up in your neck and just relax. Two more like that. Up in your shoulders, up, 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 making your waist long and relax. Last time, up, up, feet rooted into the ground and relax. We'll do four shoulder rolls going back, two, and back. And back, that's three, and four. Coming forward and front, and front and front last time one more front great from there we'll take our hands to our shoulders we'll lift our elbows to the sky we'll release our hands reaching back reaching back opening the chest and down we'll do that four times so hands to shoulders lift the elbows and reach back opening the chest and down Three more, shoulders, elbows, reach back open and down. Two more, and the elbows reaching back and down. Last time, lift the elbows and back and down. Reverse that, open the chest hands to the shoulders, bring your elbows, you can feel your back opening, and down. And reach, shoulders, elbows, down, two more, 
Don't forget to breathe and elbows and down. Reach shoulders, elbows and down. From there, we're going to kind of swim. We're gonna take our right arm and reaching back. You can take your opposite arm and just remind yourself, give yourself an opposition stretch, yeah? So we'll do four and four, it'll be eight, yeah? So to the right, opening that side, you can use that left hand, reach and to the left, opening that side body and to the right, reach more, reach more and to the left. One more time to the right. If you can, you can sit in that hip a little bit and the left. One more time, right. Reaching both directions up and down, side and side. And last time, left. Great. From there, now we're just working down the body, right? So from there, we're gonna try and lengthen out. I know you guys have been sitting for a while. So we're just gonna lengthen out the hips, right by the hip crease. So you're gonna do what we call a pelvic press. And you're just gonna kind of try and lengthen out the sides. Not anything too extreme, just the opposite of what you've been doing probably all day, right? So we'll go to the front, keep your knees soft. We'll sit in that right hip, and then we'll sit in the left hip, and you should feel a nice stretch, yeah? We'll start to the front, again with the pelvic press, feeling it stretch in the front, and then we'll go left and right. Try and open up those hips and center. We'll go front and right, and left and center. Last time, front and then left and right and center. Then we're just gonna roll our hips in a circle. You can put your hands on your hips if you'd like. Again, pelvic press to the right and back and left and front. Keep going right, right, back, left and front one more time to the right back left and front let's repeat that to the left back right and front left back right and front and last time to the left back right and front great and relax i hope you can feel that you'll be ready to sit down again so we're going to take our right leg and we're going to cross it over the front of our left leg and just prop it up like a kickstand yeah this is where you might want to use your wall or your balance i'm going to just use my chair here and then you're going to sit in this in this left hip yeah for a nice stretch my chair is on the wrong side <laughs> And then you're gonna just reach your left arm over as you're sitting in that hip. So not only are you getting a stretch in your hip, but also all the way up along the side of the body, like someone's pulling your hand. Yeah? Great. And then you won't have to turn your chair, you'll just turn your body. The right leg kick stands over the left. You sit in the, I'm sorry, the, the left leg. <laughs> Kick stands into the right hip, and then you reach over. Yeah? As you sit. Yeah? Kick the left, left leg, sit in the left hip, and reach over. And kick the left stand, sit in the right hip, and reach over. Two more times like that. The right leg kick stands, you sit in the left hip and you reach over. And then again with the left foot, sit in the right hip and reach over. Great. I hope you're feeling a little bit warmer in your hips, in your back. 
You can keep moving around, keep enjoying some nice stretching, reaching out and open. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your seminar today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Akua. That was amazing and so needed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I got a little workout too. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, I can't turn my air conditioning on because it's too loud. So <laughs> I, I, I probably heard the sirens from my windows being open as well. <laughs> New York City apartments, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so thank you again. Now that we've stretched, we can move into our final session of the day called How Did You Pivot and What Did You Learn? This video stream will end in a few minutes. So please click the Watch Next Session button below. And we'll take a few minutes, really a few minutes, um, to join at the next session. See you there. Thank you, Jose. <laughs>